What single decisions have wrecked successful companies? Story 1. Small scale. Our local pizza place did a slice meal, big slice, fries, a dip and a drink, for 5 euro. A simple 1 euro increase absolutely killed them. This was when cash was far more common and the psychology of just handing over a fiver was the ticket. Story 2. Sears not embracing the internet. Sears literally had pictures of every product, descriptions, pricing, and reviews. Their early business model was shipping products. The physical stores were a later model, but they still catalog sold. It was obvious by the mid-late 90s that the internet was changing how companies reach customers. Sears even sold and promoted personal computers. It would have been so simple for them to place all their catalog items on the internet. All the information was already on an internal database. Amazon wouldn't exist as more than a bookseller if Sears didn't sit with their thumb up their bum while Jeff Bezos literally used their own model against them. Story 3. Gerald Ratner, CEO of the Ratner Group, operated a popular and successful jewelry business in the UK in the 1980s. He managed to sink his entire business enterprise in under 10 seconds when he made a public TV appearance and joked that his company's products were total crap. The value of his business dropped by about half a billion pounds in the immediate aftermath and almost went completely out of business. Story 4. THQ was one of the bigger publishers in video games. They held Darksiders, Saints Row, Destroy All Humans, and had deals with Disney, DreamWorks, Nickelodeon, and the WWE. They developed the U-Draw game tablet, a $70 drawing tablet accessory for the Wii, PS3, and 360. This tablet was a sales deister and single-handedly killed THQ. The company went bankrupt, and Nordic Games purchased big swaths of their IP. Today they make games under the name THQ Nordic, but original THQ died at the hands of the tablets. What is funny is obviously Nintendo went on to make the Wii U, another sales flub, but obviously they must have taken some inspo from the U-Draw. Story 5. Artesian Builds. Company CEO Noah Katz gets on their normal PC building live stream where they are going to give away a PC to one of their affiliates. Name gets drawn. Katz looks up the affiliate, reads out the metadata for the affiliate, decides this person isn't important enough, and rescinds the offer. All proudly live on stream. This happened on March 1st, 2022. The company announced they were shutting down eight days later. Story 6, two obvious cases come to mind. Kodak, remember the film brand? Invented the digital camera in 1979, but did not pursue that line because they thought it would hurt film sales. Blockbuster Video had an opportunity to merge with Netflix to manage online streaming content but declined. Blockbuster was sure that video rental would never end. Story 7 Yahoo had an opportunity to acquire Google for around $1 million, but decided not to. Since then, Yahoo, which was once a tech giant, saw a significant decline over the years and was acquired by Verizon in 2017 for about $4 billion. Fast forward to today, Google is now a powerhouse worth around $2T. Story 8 haven't seen it yet, but GE making Jack Welch CEO. GE was one of the gold star companies of the U.S. Everybody wanted to work at GE because you'd be set for life. They took care of their employees, made a ton of money, made good products. What more could you ask for? Then Jack Welch came in and started firing people left and right, eliminating product lines, getting into finance, worrying about the stock growth. Fast forward to today where GE is now three separate companies, healthcare, energy, and aviation. Jack Welch pretty much single-handedly broke down a company that was started by Edison and made some of the greatest technological advancements in the last century. That man is the worst. Story 9. Hiring Ron Johnson at JCPenney. He first decided to never have sales or coupons that fair pricing with no makeups just to make them down didn't work. People never got coupons or sales flyers, so they never went in. It made sense logically, but shoppers like to think they are getting discounts. He also thought he would make it cool place. It's J.C. Penney in a mall. It's not going to be cool in the 2010s. He did great with Apple stores, but Apple customers, especially Apple store customers, aren't J.C. Penney customers. Story 10. Intel's decision to forego purchasing ASML's EUV lithography machines until their competitors purchased all of ASML's production putting Intel years behind. To their credit, Intel took delivery of one of ASML's machines about six months ago. These machines are so advanced that it will be another 18 months until Intel can manufacture chips using these machines. Story 11. Omni Consumer Products. They sealed their fate when they rushed ahead with the ED-209, a poorly tested, overly violent robot meant for law enforcement. They ignored serious design flaws in favor of cutting costs and maximizing profits, which led to a disastrous malfunction that killed an executive in the middle of a board meeting. But the real blow came when they mishandled RoboCop, 
Instead of recognizing RoboCop as an opportunity for positive change, they tried to use him as a tool for their corrupt agenda. That short-sighted greed combined with their earlier blunders set the stage for their downfall. OCP's story is a reminder that even the biggest companies can collapse when they put profit over ethics and common sense. Story 12. Blizzard, deciding to make every game just a crappy platform for microtransactions without focusing on making a fun game. They haven't felt the full effect yet, but after Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2, I know a lot of people, including myself, who will never buy another Blizzard title. They rode on the coattails of their early 2000s staff for as long as they could. I know it's Activision now. Story 13. Fordson Farming Company in the U.S. failed because Henry Ford was stubborn as hell. It's a niche topic. But since I do own a Fordson, so let me explain. There was a war going on in the U.S. between companies building farm equipment and traction engines, which were essentially highly specialized gas or wood-powered machines. Due to the machines all being somewhat specialized, repairing them was an issue since all the parts were specific to that one model, and most of them were only good for one or two jobs, which made them not as profitable. So here comes Henry Ford, who developed the Fordson traction engine till 1907, by the same principle that they built the Ford Model T, using existing and automotive parts, making production and assembly easy and fast. The result was a cheap, affordable, all-round tractor for the average farmer. It was making all the other manufacturers sweat, with the original Fordson being an extremely useful and easy-to-repair traction engine. Fordson was selling a lot of the original Fordson as a result. Fun fact on the side, it was called Fordson because the Ford Motor Company board did not like Ford's idea, so he founded the Ford & Son Company, Fordson. Anyway, the original Fordson was causing the other companies like International and Deering problems, and they had to step up their game because Fordson was still selling a lot of tractors. The bad business decision, though? Henry Ford refused to further develop the Fordson tractor. He thought it was already a near-perfect machine and did not need improvement. The Ford & Son LTD then failed in 1928, in the U.S. having only produced this one model for about 20 years. Henry Ford ran the Fordson brand bankrupt because he refused to adjust to the changing market when other companies had caught up and produced better tractors than the original Fordson. Another fun fact, the Fordson brand survived in the U.K., though, producing different new models until 1965 under the Fordson farming brand as part of the English Ford Motor Company. I, myself, own a beautiful 1958 Fordson 957 E-Dexta diesel. In the 60s, the Ford Motor Company fused the Fordson brand into their Ford Agriculture brand. Story 14. MySpace limited you to 10 photos that you had to rotate out after the limit. Facebook let you upload unlimited photos in April 2005. Immediately, everyone I knew tried to get their college email address credentials so that they could sign up for the Facebook and post see pictures after every party. And then in October, Facebook to add insult to injury, let you tag people, and that was the end of MySpace. Now, not only was Facebook where photos from the party were posted, but you would also be tagged, so that created a viral incentive to connect to people and sign them up for the Facebook website, which amplified the social network effect exponentially. You don't want people tagging you in photos that you don't know about, do you? Better sign up and review those tags. MySpace was already beyond irritating by letting everybody play a different song in the background, causing you to want to rip your ears out of your head from 19 different Limp Biscuit songs playing simultaneously. But I think they could have survived long enough to disable autoplay music if they had simply not put a limit on photo count. Story 15. A local delivery company where I live. They had amazing wages and benefits. Every driver was clamoring to get a job there. The crew so big, the only reason there were other delivery companies was so they didn't run foul of anti-monopoly. Then they decided to review their payment structure and reduce the amount you got paid per haul across the board. Another big delivery company looking to get established in the area then offered the exact same wages they had previously offered. They lost 80% of their employees in the first month, and even though they went back on the pay reduction, they slowly died out over the next year. Story 16. The softer side of Sears' campaign of the early 1990 deaths when management decided to de-emphasize Sears' longtime strength in so-called hard lines, tools, automotive, appliances, electronics, etc., and instead focus on women's clothing. It was a flop. Sure, the market for women's clothing is a huge one, probably more than all hard lines put together, but there's also a huge amount of competition, and Sears' stodgy, somewhat old-fashioned image was not well-suited for a market that thrives on trendiness. Note that this was Asterisk before Asterisk Eddie slithered out from under his rock and began to dismantle Sears. 
Story 17. So this didn't wreck the company completely per se, but did do a lot of damage. Merck rushed Vioxx to market because it was a first-in-class slash blockbuster medicine, which is the holy grail of big pharma. If you have the one and only type of medicine on the market and it works, that's basically a money printing machine. And they got that with Vioxx. They chose to ignore FDA regulations and marketed it for something that it was not intended to be used for when applying for a license, rheumatoid arthritis, and the drug reps were lying about safety data for cardiac risks. It ended up costing the company tilde dollar five billion in criminal and civil trials and FDA fines. I started working there at the end of the Vioxx payouts and the cuts to many benefits was staggering LOL. Every time something else would go, including jobs, people would blame Vioxx. Story 18. They didn't go bankrupt, but it did destroy the company for a minute. J.C. Penney got a new CEO a while back who said, instead of sales, let's do everyday low prices. This sounds good in hindsight, since you cut employee costs of always putting out new tags, materials, etc. However, the human brain likes sales, and in a year, the company almost went under. They quickly got rid of the CEO and recouped their losses. Story 19. Look up the Osborne Effect. Osborne was a computer company that created a portable computer. It was massive, like a suitcase computer. Anyway, the Osborne one was quite a hit. The company then decided to build on that success with the Osborne 2 computer, which would be better, etc. They planned to use proceeds from the Osborne one to finance the development of the Osborne 2. Now the huge mistake, at a trade show or something, they announced the Osborne 2, and with great pride, announced how great it was going to be. But they had no Osborne 2S, it wasn't ready. This was just hyping up the crowd and marketing. Now for the Osborne effect. Upon announcing the Osborne 2, the sales of the Osborne 1 dropped like a rock. Why would you buy an Osborne 1 if the Osborne 2 was coming and promised to be a much better computer? And now without sales of the Osborne 1, they could not finance the development of the Osborne 2. So now they had a product that wouldn't sell because customers were waiting for a product that couldn't be made without sales of the product that nobody would buy. I saw this effect in the firearms world recently. A new company called Hudson Engineering created a pistol that was supposed to be revolutionary, and it did in fact have many good features. It sold a lot and there were some issues, but they could fix them, funded by great sales, and then they announced a new model that they didn't have. The new gun would be the same, but made of aluminum instead of steel so it would be lighter. Sales of the gun dropped. They could no longer pay suppliers. They couldn't recover R&D costs. They couldn't and didn't repair guns. People got angry and sales dropped even further and then they went bankrupt. So, do not announce a product you don't have. Story 20. American car companies declaring they will go all electric by a set date. Now I realize they have all pivoted, but they did this without vetting what the consumer truly wanted versus being pretty much forced to go that route because of the government. They have all pivoted, as have all companies globally, except Toyota, to offer more hybrids, what it appears the consumer wants, with some ICE and electric offerings. It is very interesting how all along Toyota kept saying hybrids were the answer for today. Story 21. Susan G. Komen hired Karen Handel after her failed bid for GA Gov on an anti-abortion platform. Karen convinced the founder that defunding Planned Parenthood mammograms would increase donations from the right. They didn't realize how many of their donors were not conservatives. Massive PR debacle and wave of donors asking for refunds. So Komen said, oops, that was a bad move, so we're not defunding Planned Parenthood mammograms. Conservatives then asked for donation refunds, and non-conservatives stayed away. The nonprofit went from the most trusted name in charities to shuttering most of its local offices and reducing its revenue close to minus 60%. Story 22. When Amazon was taking off, brick-and-mortar bookstores were losing business. Barnes & Noble made the sensible choice to downsize and closed many stores while developing an online platform. Borders, on the other hand, decided the best thing to do was build as many new stores as possible. When this didn't increase sales, they decided it was finally time to try online shopping. However, they decided to partner with Amazon and have them handle all of Borders' online business, effectively handing all the extra revenue directly to their biggest competitor. Guess which store is still in business? Story 23, I always think of TWA Airlines. TWA was a legacy airline from the earliest days of airlines. However, after deregulation in the 70s, they were struggling to compete. Desperate for cash, they allowed corporate raider Carl Icahn to purchase majority ownership of the airline, which provided some much-needed cash. 
Included in the takeover agreement was a small clause that required TWA to sell tickets to any of Icon's companies at cost, meaning zero profit. It sounded like maybe TWA would give a few seats to some corporate travelers. Nope, one of Icon's companies was a travel agency, and they sold huge numbers of tickets to the general public below market value and for zero profit to the airline. Flights would be 100% full and make no money. Hamstrung by the inability to adjust fares to make a profit, the airline was forced to cut costs, cut or eliminate popular services and benefits, and cease flying on some routes altogether. Eventually, TWA could not survive, and it was bought by American Airlines in 2000. Story 24 Yahoo! Not buying Google for $1 million. They could have also bought Facebook in 2006. Yahoo! having the technology to do live streaming, like Twitch music streaming, like Spotify, video sharing, like YouTube, and TV movie streaming, like Netflix. Not even joking, Yahoo! had the ability to do all of these things before 2005 and just didn't promote or pursue these ventures. Story 25. This new trend of NFL teams going all in on someone and it's pretty much never worked out. First it was the Raiders for Gruden, then the Browns for Watson, and very likely the Jets for Rodgers. Granted, these places weren't exactly successful before, but none of them have even remotely moved the needle and they'll all take years to recover from. Story 26. This new trend of NFL teams going all in on someone and it's pretty much never worked out. First it was the Raiders for Gruden, then the Browns for Watson, and very likely the Jets for Rodgers. Granted, these places weren't exactly successful before, but none of them have even remotely moved the needle and they'll all take years to recover from. Story 27. I would say this was a nearly wreck Bob Chapek reorganizing how Disney did entertainment aka movies and TV shows. The reorganizing was like something a kid straight out of college would do and was instantly hated by everyone. It stripped control from the creative people in the company and placed it squarely with the company executives. It was one of the big reasons Chapek was ousted. Every executive who was asked to run the newly created division declined, and Chapek ended up putting a longtime friend in charge who had zero experience in entertainment. When Igor came back, one of the first things he did was undo the change. Story 28. Does it count if I let someone who was clearly hired to replace me, who had no knowledge of how to do my job, take credit for something I had done, so my boss would think his master plan was complete and fire me before my replacement could actually get to grips with the job. I mean, I assume they went bankrupt the following week, but I never looked into it. Story 29. Usually it boils down to two things in my experience. One, senior management are more afraid to break their own business by embracing a big change that will safeguard the future, and so someone else does it and wipes them out or two. Senior management loses the imagination and creativity to make positive customer-led changes, so they focus on marginal cost savings, which are achieved through ridding themselves of expensive people and processes. Those that have all the institutional knowledge and the things that made the company great in the first place, Boeing is a great example of this. Story 30. I'm not saying wrecked, that's a stretch. But Frank Wells' decision to get on a helicopter in 1994 left Michael Eisner in sole charge at Disney and eventually led to him destroying key relationships with Pixar, building cheap parks that destroyed Imagineering's reputation for building on Walt's legacy, and putting a strategic planning department in charge that stifled creativity and leadership. Wells plus Eisner together were a match made in heaven. When Wells died, Eisner lost all sense of direction. Bob Iger had to do a lot of work to fix his mistakes when he took over as CEO. Story 31 if you take any intro business or economics class in the Rochester, New York area, they make sure to present a whole case study on how Kodak the bed by convincing themselves that real photographers would stick with film instead of digital cameras. They eventually did get into the digital space, but it was far too late. I graduated college with a STEM degree into the job market created when they laid off like 30K plus people, including a load of engineers and PhD scientists. That was fun. Story 32. They're still around for now. But Hertz lost a billion dollars after investing a ton of dough into EVs and just ousted their last CEO over it. Turns out spare parts are expensive, hard to get. Oh, and customers hate renting them too. It's going to take years for them to normalize after this disaster, if they survive at all. Story 33. Say what you will about Whole Foods, but working for them used to be a great job. I started with them in 2004 at $12 per hour and was at $15 when I left. Everyone could get health insurance and it was good coverage. Long-time employees got stock bonuses, bad managers were either given more training or fired, and employees got a 25% discount. Then Amazon bought it, and it became just like any other grocery job, except without a union like the other big chains. As a shopper, 
The quality of the in-house foods has gone down and the level of service has tanked. Story 34. For my own company, requiring us to return to the office in the summer of 2023. This decision precipitated a mass exodus of talented veteran employees and a huge decline in morale for those of us who are still here. Needless to say, our metrics and profit margins have been on a steady downslide ever since. Unfortunately, the CEO and board of directors are almost certainly getting a kickback from the city government, so it is unlikely we'll see them reverse course anytime soon. Story 35 Blockbuster Twice First time not wanting to mail DVDs and instead rely on individual physical stores. Netflix started eating their lunch. Second one time was realizing mailing DVD actually was something they should do, just as streaming was starting. Blockbuster was one of the rare companies, industries, who appeared, exploded in size, and became part of basically everyone's life, then collapsed and vanished all within a 30-year period. Kodak invents and patents the digital camera, then buries it so as not to harm their photo film business. Hopes no other companies will realize digital camera could be big and then proceeds to be completely wiped out by the thing it invented but would not sell. Story 36. Recently watched the movie BlackBerry. The CEO underestimating the potential popularity and use case of the iPhone. And then, upon realizing it, shifting the manufacturing to China in order to produce phones to compete with the iPhone turned out to be a company-ending move. Story 37. A bad marketing campaign, especially an expensive one, can wreck a company if it utterly misses the target population or worse offends a ton of people and starts a boycott for being insensitive or whatever. I've also seen companies spend millions on something like a singular Super Bowl ad and miss the mark and that's like their whole annual marketing budget. Pepsi, for example, wasn't wrecked by it and still is extremely successful. Did their Super Bowl ad a few years ago about protesters giving a police officer a Pepsi and suddenly the situation de-escalated into a party. This was like peak BLM protests, and there was riots going on. Not exactly the move I would have made. It's Pepsi, though. So they could afford to take a hit but a smaller company? No chance. That's my point. Story 38. Knight Capital Group, a major player in U.S. equities trading, faced a near-catastrophic crisis on August 1, 2012, when a flaw in new trading software led to an unintended buying spree, acquiring $7 billion in stocks within the first hour of trading. Unable to cover these trades, Knight sought to cancel them, but the SEC allowed most to stand, requiring Knight to sell the shares quickly. This forced sale, which drove prices down, resulted in a $440 million loss, but Goldman Sachs stepped in to purchase the excess stock. The event drained Knight's capital and threatened its viability, prompting a $400 million cash infusion from investors a week later ultimately leading to its acquisition by Getco LLC the following summer. Morale, TRE, importance of robust software testing and risk management in financial trading. Story 39. Nokia not adopting Android. They insisted on doubling down with their own OS, which the masses weren't excited about. They continued to lose market share to Apple and Samsung. Then they signed an exclusivity deal with Microsoft to use Windows Phone. Ultimately, Microsoft acquired them and ran them to the ground. Story 40. The boeing McDonnell douglas merger. Ever since MD took over several aspects of business decisions, the safety and quality of Boeing planes really started taking a nosedive. Case in point, the 787 was the first clean sheet design Boeing produced after the merger, and it had problems right off the bat. A few more years down the line, and the 737 MAX crashes only put what has been happening for years on full display. This is why models pre-merger have been trouble-free for the most part, like the 737 nanograms the current 777 and 747 classic lineups. Story 41. Zenith Innovations was once a leading pioneer in the field of sustainable energy solutions. They decided to cut corners on quality control for one of its flagship solar panel products. Executives believed that the risk was minimal and that the short-term financial gains would outweigh any potential long-term consequences. The company's reputation was tarnished irreparably and customers lost trust in their brand. As a result, Zenith Innovations experienced a sharp decline in sales, faced numerous lawsuits, and ultimately filed for bankruptcy. Story 42. In Australia, the two only vehicle manufacturers, Holden and Ford, made incredibly popular cars for the domestic and international market. They would make the decision to pay their employees way over their award wages. I'm all for employees earning more, but there's a point where it becomes a huge issue. The federal government would inject huge sums of money whenever both would be floundering. By the end of both, they were only making a couple of grand profit per car, and it wasn't enough to keep them afloat. So GM and Ford pulled out of the Australian manufacturing market. 
Ford still exists, but Holden is now gone. Story 43. I'm late to this party, but one I don't see is the Coleco Atom, one of the single worst PCs ever made. It's downright legendary how poorly it was designed. Maybe most infamously, it didn't have proper internal shielding, and so every time it booted up, it let off a small EMP that could potentially erase any tape or disc nearby. Yes, really. It was such an epic failure that it basically killed off Coleco's entire home electronics division and set the company on track for a bankruptcy a few years later. But perhaps even worse than that, prior to the Atom's release, the ColecoVision console was beating the 1983 gaming crash. It was actually growing in sales and players, even as Atari crumbled. Left alone, it might have actually kept the second gen alive. But then the Atom destroyed all of that. Story 44 hasn't yet. But the decision one of the franchises for Krispy Kreme to keep selling the box-glazed donuts in stores and gas station bakery cases for two days instead of their proclaimed fresh daily. Seriously. After about 10 hours, the glaze looks like great-grandma's wrinkles. Story 45. Consulting firm I am currently working for has decided to nearshore hundreds of dev roles to Costa Rica for one quarter the cost of a U.S. or Canada dev, except every single client has been pissed off about using offshore devs because our Brunos is heavily built around U.S. and Canada devs. We've lost three-quarters of our future contracts largely over this, and MGMT's decision is to lean into it harder. Story 46, Polaroid used to be the masters of all things camera and film. Instant cameras, film, prints. They even had contracts to digitize artwork, which they squandered. Look at Google now. As well as doing state driver's licenses and working with high-end printers and scanners and so on. Mid-1990 EES realized a small company called Adobe was doing a cool little product to touch up photos, so they started to work on a product, internal code name, before and after, that would rival that. A year in, they thought that doing software was too expensive and sold off the digital division. They said they were focusing on their key products, such as non-digital cameras, film, etc. Too late, they started looking at digital cameras. Story 47 one major decision that comes to mind is Blockbuster's refusal to buy Netflix in the early 2000s. They were at their peak and had a chance to invest in a burgeoning streaming service, but they dismissed it as a fad. Instead of adapting to the changing landscape of home entertainment, they stuck to their brick-and-mortar rental model and ended up going bankrupt. It's a classic example of a company not recognizing the potential of new technology and failing to innovate. Another case is Kodak, which had all the resources to lead the digital photography market, but instead chose to focus on film for too long. They invented the first digital camera, but were so afraid of cannibalizing their film sales that they didn't act on it. Both instances show how being too stuck in the past can lead to downfall in a rapidly changing world. Story 48. Whatever Skype did, it was the standard for video chats, group voice, and messaging ages before WhatsApp, Zoom, and Discord were common. I took a grad course in fall 2019 and worked out with the prof that I'd attend some lectures virtually. I joined via Skype. Six months later, everyone was locked down and meeting working remotely via Zoom. Story 49. Every few years, a mid-sized publishing company decides to go all in on electronic textbooks and testing. They usually sell off their consumer imprints to do it. On paper, it makes sense. Textbooks are high-margin products and the market is much more predictable than fiction or DIY. In reality, it doesn't quite work out because the marketplace is already crowded with competitors. It's also highly dependent on getting instructors to adopt your product, which means they need large and super attentive sales forces. Often their predictions don't take into account downturns in academic publishing, which does happen. Wiley did it. A few others. I wouldn't call them wrecked, but the choice moved them into slow decline instead of financial health. HMH arguably was successful at this, so it did work in at least that one case. Story 50. Elon buying Twitter really caused a ruckus, if you ask me. Although you could argue that Twitter wasn't really successful if you take their pathetic monetization schemes at the time into consideration. I think their tech and their product were great, though. Next theme. Those who hid pets from a landlord and the landlord found out what happened. Story 1. We had actually signed a pet addendum that the agent gave us and paid an additional pet deposit. Turns out the landlord had no knowledge of this, didn't give the go-ahead for an addendum to be created, and didn't allow pets at all. Fortunately, we had copies and copies of the emails the agent sent us with the document attached. They asked us for proof of all vaccinations and parasitics from the vet per the fake addendum or threatened to take the whole pet deposit. We provided the documents and they didn't take any of the pet deposit. Guess the agent screwed up royally, but it was a good lesson to learn. Keep absolutely everything, even if you don't think it's necessary. Story two, had an apartment in a pet-free building. Then one of the units caught fire. 
When the landlord arrived, everyone was outside with their dogs, cats, birds, and the fire department was inside still looking for a pet skunk that had escaped. That was a fun morning. Landlord just left. No one got in trouble for their pets. And yes, the skunk was saved. Story 3. My roommate had a fluffy orange cat already. And about two months into living together, I adopted a old man tuxedo kitty from the shelter. I don't know why I never mentioned it to the landlady. She was a wacky hippie type who lived an hour away and almost never came to the apartment. But eventually my roommate broke the lease and moved out of state, and I stayed till the end of the lease. When the landlady came by for the final check when I was moving out, she looked at my black and white cat and said, Huh, I could have sworn your cat was orange. Guess I gotta slow down on the pot. I did not correct her lol. Story 4 my landlord found my hamster when getting the apartment master keys that I found on the floor from one of them employees. I found it at night and took the keys. Then first thing in the morning I called them. They wanted the keys ASAP to where they wanted to enter my apartment when I was at work. They saw the hamster and said nothing as I saved them $1,000 S from having to change locks. Story 5 Ooh, I had a good one happen. It was my first apartment and my GF's friend dumped a kitten on me as a birthday present because she'd heard me talking about getting a cat and found a box of them on the side of the road. I love that cat, but don't do this, kids. It took six months before the property manager managed to catch sight of the cat in the window while walking the property. I got an email asking about it. I lied and said I just got the cat and hadn't had a chance to notify them yet. They said, cool, the pet deposit is $200. So I cut them a check and dropped it off at the office, expecting that to be that. Two weeks later, I get a knock at the door. It's the property manager with a pet gift basket, telling me that my cat was the reason they caught an employee embezzling tens of thousands of dollars. The off-cycle check knocked over the precarious tower of cards one of the receptionists had been maintaining, and it all came tumbling down. Kitty got lots of treats that night, Lowell. Story 6. I lived in a small basement apartment and rescued a sick elderly cat. He wasn't capable of jumping up into the windowsill, so I didn't have to worry about that. I came home one night around 3 a.m. and caught the building supervisor, lived across the hall from me, taking out trash, and there was a cat standing in the doorway. We both froze for a moment, and then I told him I'd keep quiet about his secret cat if he would let me hide mine during inspections, and he agreed. Now we have a couple of nearly identical cats, so they get merged into a single pet on applications. My spouse and I have started collecting letters about our cleanliness as pet owners whenever we move to give to the next landlord, and so far it's worked out well. Story 7. At one apartment we lived at, you could have cats but not dogs. I had a very large black cat. One day I was bringing him home from the vet and carried him in my arms. The property manager saw me, and when I went back out to my car to get his carrier in my purse, the property manager told me I wasn't allowed to have dogs. When I told him I didn't have any dogs, he asked about the black dog he just saw me carrying. I laughed and told him that was my cat, and he could come see if he wanted. He told me it was all right. He believed me. Weeks later, the property manager saw me and told him he saw my cat on the balcony one day, and it was one of the biggest cats he had ever seen. Story 8. I had an illegal cat when living in a student room. Pets weren't allowed, but hell if I was to live without a cat. One of my friends lived in the same house and had cats as well. She told me the landlord hardly ever came round, so took my chances. Had an awesome time with my little cat. She helped me not be lonely, first time on my own. But of course, after about a year... The landlord came by unexpectedly, and she greeted him happily. Sigh. He told me she had to go. I was so upset, didn't know what to do. And even though I was already an adult, my father called the landlord and managed to convince the man to let me keep her for the remaining eight months I'd be living there. There was a fixed moment since I had to go study abroad and would move out. Always loved my dad for it. And of course, the landlord was awesome for allowing it. Bought him a big bottle of expensive booze as a thank you. The cat sadly died last year. She was 16 and had always stayed my little girl. She hated most people but loved my now husband. Loved her and still miss her. Story 9. My parents hid a cat from their landlord in their first apartment, which had a no pets policy. The cat insisted on sleeping in a window where everyone could see her. Obviously, the landlord found out, but he never said anything about it other than, that's a pretty cat you've got there. Story 10. Oh, this just happened for me. Took in a stray who was meowing outside my window one night. Turned out to be pregnant and gave birth a month after I let her in. Had them from the last day of May to the start of September, when the landlord found out about them. Told me to either get rid of them or get them fixed. But I told her my plan was to let them stay together for the 12 weeks they're supposed to be together. Then give them away to good homes, mother included. Luckily, my landlord was cool about it and let me stick to my plan. Miss my babies every day. Story 11. I had a friendly stray cat, probably a pet someone dumped. 
who decided to move into my place when I was renting while in grad school. The landlord was very hands-off and very rarely came around, but after I'd had this cat for months, he did stop in because my AC was broken. I'd planned on making sure the cat was outside when the landlord was going to come by, but then he just popped up unannounced. Because it was hot as hell inside my house, I'd open my doors for air circulation. Landlord walks in and sees the cat lounging on my living room floor, and he was like, oh, I didn't know you had a cat. I looked that man dead in the eye and said, I don't know that cat. IDK if he believed me or not, but he shrugged and nothing more was said about it. The cat and I continued living there for like three more years. Story 12. Not my story, but my fiancé's friend. He and his now ex-GF had five cats, two ferrets, and over ten guinea pigs in their apartment. They started off with a couple cats, snuck them in. Collection of animals grew over time. They lived there for a good few years. Eventually, people began to complain of the smells and noises they heard whenever there was an inspection. They'd know ahead of time, so they would go bring the animals to a family member's house or whatever. One day, landlord got enough complaints, so he went to check out the apartment unplanned. Did not call them. Found the animals, gave them a hefty fine, and kicked them out rightfully so. That apartment just reeked. It was horrible. Story 13. I never hid pets myself, but I worked in a nebulous leasing maintenance role during college and had a couple run-ins with unfriendly dogs that were not supposed to be in an apartment. Nothing like having a large dog appear out of nowhere to bark at you when you're just there to update the fire extinguisher. We also had people abandon pets we didn't know were there a number of times, and that was always horrible to varying degrees. There were a couple times we found really starved animals and didn't know if they were neglected before or if the people bailed and didn't tell us. Story 14. Landlord here. I don't care if you have pets, but lying to me means I won't be renewing your lease. Pets destroy things, and so I have extra insurance if you have one. It's like $30 a month, and if you can't afford that, you can't afford a pet. Reason being, of course, when I first rented my place out, I was naive and said, yeah, no problem, only for their dog to destroy carpets, chew on things, and cause thousands of dollars of damage that I had to cover. The insurance requires me to register the breed and age of the pets, and I'm not covered if it's not accurate. So be upfront. Pay the extra, and everyone is happy. Story 15. Not mine, but my two of roommates had a dog each when I was in college. We had been having sink garbage disposal issues and had submitted a work order for it, and the maintenance guy ended up coming over when everyone was out. Both of the dogs were in their cages, but only one barked when they heard him come in. This scared the other dog, or something because he ended up painting the wall behind his cage in brown. Maintenance guy heard this, goes to check it out, and finds the poor dog as well as the wall covered in poop. That was a crazy situation to go back home to now that I think about it. Story 16. We originally wanted to get a dog, but our landlord declined due to dogs being noisy. So we got our cat, but didn't let him know. Later on, there was a mouse problem in the apartment building. An exterminator came in with our landlord to look around and ask if we've seen any mice. We hadn't, and the exterminator didn't find any proof that the mice had entered our apartment. The exterminator saw our cat tree, pointed to it, and went, This is why they're the only ones with no mice. My landlord looked at us at the cat tree, then went, I guess that worked out, huh? We got lucky that our cat potentially saved him money, lol. His wife met our cat recently, and our cat made sure to get in her good graces, too. Edit sp. Story 17. When my building super found out we had cats, she started coming into my apartment without notice to bring them gifts. I came home one day, and my cat had a little bandana collar on. He never wears a collar. I don't buy him toys with bells because he'll never let me sleep again. So where did this jingle ball come from? It was the super. In my city, the law was that if anyone from management knew we had pets and they did nothing for like 90 days, they couldn't enforce the no pets clause anymore. So I said nothing and let her do her thing. Story 18. Not me personally, but I was maintenance supervisor at an upscale apartment complex and they didn't allow cats. One day the manager and I were walking the property and we looked over to a ground floor apartment and there was a cat playing in the window. Sadly, this starts evictions proceedings. I never reported pets when I encountered them in apartments and the manager was very sympathetic in these situations. Story 19 College Apartment Complex My dumbass roommate found a cat on the side of the street and decided to adopt it even though I was allergic to it. It scratched up the two couches and walls in the main shared space. The way the apartment found out is she cut a square in the window blinds for the cat to look out. On the first floor, an apartment employee walked by and saw the cat sitting in the window. Ended up costing her tilde dollar 4K in fines and replacement couches. Story 20. First, don't do this. It isn't worth the hassle. And when your landlord does find out, you'll be in a real bind. Unless you intend to be homeless, you'll have to move overnight or give up your pet. 
you'll also be on the hook for big dollar cleaning fees in addition to losing your deposit. I haven't specifically defied my lease and owned an under-the-table pet. I did used to bring my dog to my girlfriend's apartment quite often. Dogs were allowed. She had her own dog. We kept things very discreet and never bothered other tenants whatsoever. The landlord still caught wind and basically said, never again or get evicted. We never considered that the maintenance guy had to come through eventually. And it's unfortunately his job to deal with the mess if an unaccounted pet destroys the place, so it's going to be reported. You'd also be surprised how much your neighbors will snoop and report anything they don't like. People love rules and hate to see others pulling a fast one to earn an advantage they don't get. Story 21. Got dobbed in by the people living behind us because my cat would sit in the window and watch them walk by every day. I told the property manager I was pet sitting for my parents and then kept the blinds down for a couple of months. Then emailed the PM again and told them my parents were permanently moving overseas and I needed to take in their cat because she had nowhere else to go. I'm sure they would have seen straight through the lie, but luckily, the laws around renting with pets in my state were due to change in a few months anyway, so we got approved. 